Facebook's purpose was to connect people. Then you can browse around and see who people's friends are and just check out people's online identities. Google's was to share information. We have a tremendous uh, ability uh, and, and responsibility to provide people the right information. Twitter is to encourage public discourse. Never before have we had such access to that immediate information. But then business models evolved and platforms grew. And now we're at 100,000 people, so who knows where we're going next. Facebook, which announced today that it had signed up its 500 millionth user. So are you going to add me as a friend? The business world is salivating over the possibility of a public stock offering, an IPO. Their research project turned into a much praised search engine. It is called Google. Have you Googled her yet? Willow, she's 17. It's a search engine. Shares are up more than 1,700% in those 12 years. Many believe Jack Dorsey is the intellectual successor to Jobs. I think Twitter remains the first draft of history, which is pretty important. But then unintended and troubling consequences followed. Representatives from Facebook, Twitter, and Google now facing a firestorm about Russia's attempts to meddle in the 2016 election. Purchasing ads that reached millions of Americans designed to create divisions on a whole range of topics, including immigration, gun control, and race. Fake accounts created by Moscow reached more Americans than the total number of U.S. citizens who voted. So just to be clear, you're not going to sell or share any of the information on Facebook. What the terms say is just, we're not going to share people's information. But how are you going to make money if you won't sell or share people's information? The model is advertising. In 2012 and 2013, social media usage was skyrocketing. Facebook had a billion users. There were over 100 billion Google searches per month. By 2014, the tech giants had acquired smaller companies, including advertising exchanges and services like YouTube and Instagram. So they became even more central to our attention. And then also they were creating new tools for advertisers so that advertisers could reach people with even more precision and even more targeting. Those tools included services like Facebook's lookalike audiences and custom audiences, both of which launched in 2013. They allowed advertisers to target individuals with tailor-made messaging. With social media is a very different kind of animal. You can target it at exactly who you want to. You can figure out what their interests and biases might be, what race someone is, what age group someone is, where they live. And you can deliver exactly the message to those folks that is most likely to persuade them. You just enter the amount of money that you're willing to spend and we'll make sure to, to put those ads in front of the best candidates to receive them, both in terms of your targeting choices and Facebook's own algorithm. Other platforms offer the same capability, Google, LinkedIn, Twitter, Snapchat. It's become the industry standard. The platforms were able to directly capitalize on the data consumers gave them in order to help companies target those same people with ads. You can do that if you're selling um, a new energy drink, or you can do that if you're trying to disrupt an election. The techniques are the same. And that is exactly what Russia did. They used digital tools to try to influence an election. Jacob Shapiro is a professor at Princeton University who wrote about trends in foreign influence efforts in elections. We define a foreign influence effort as um, one state targeting another uh, on social media in a manner that is intended to appear organic to the target state. So for us, what was important was not that the information was fake or real. What was important to us is that it was one state reaching out and trying to create content which looked like it was coming from another state. Shapiro found the Russians started foreign influence efforts masked as digital campaigns all over the world. Starting in 2014, a troll farm known as the Internet Research Agency, or the IRA, promoted propaganda on social media in the U.S. You know, you had hundreds of people and they worked on different things. Financial offices, they had graphics offices, they had engagement teams. And so in a way, it looks like any kind of startup anywhere in the world. By 2016, they had started more than 20 campaigns in 13 countries. 
40% of those campaigns were on Facebook, nearly 90% were on Twitter. They were on fake websites, Reddit, WhatsApp, and Russian-controlled media, basically anywhere that digital content could be spread. So there was a sort of sophisticated understanding of who uses the platforms, what they use them for, and what messages might resonate best on those platforms, and then how to use the targeting capabilities of those platforms to test and hone messages with greater effectiveness. All the same things that a good marketer would do. And just as the IRA had fully ramped up its efforts, Google and Facebook sharpened how precisely individual users could be targeted. The degree of precision that was possible uh, became basically ready for prime time just as we were going into the peak of the election season. Russia didn't just target people on social media. Russian military intelligence, often referred to as the GRU, tried to push propaganda into the larger media ecosystem. What they would do is they would plant a seed of a story. That story would be repeated by other media properties would pick it up. So there would be this like chain of citation. The GRU created fake think tanks and alternative news sites to help plant false stories. They created fake online accounts to author and amplify this content. Instead of trying to get a real sympathetic person to write your story for you, you can just create a fake persona. The GRU also strategically leaked and hacked information to WikiLeaks and direct messaged journalists at opportune moments of the 2016 campaign. This just in the CNN Russian hackers managed to infiltrate the computer network at the Democratic National Committee. We know Clinton's dealing with some new email leaks of her own campaign woes there following the third dump, really, of hacked emails. You can't separate propaganda from um, the kind of infrastructure that's putting it out. So social platforms are really great for targeted niche content, but if you want to reach the entirety of a country, get all of a country talking about a particular thing, uh, this is where you start to see the role of mainstream media in, uh, in shaping the conversation around those materials. So the GRU used sensationalism to engage traditional media, while the IRA targeted voters on social media platforms. Effectively, they worked toward the same goal using different strategies. The president-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. Ladies and gentlemen, the president-elect of the United States, Donald John Trump. blockbuster charges today from the special counsel investigating Russia's election interference. The indictment charges 12 Russian military officers by name for conspiring to interfere with the 2016 presidential election. What has Google done to make sure this doesn't happen again? Our efforts have been pretty successful uh, so far, Google as a whole, through both our election cycles but it's an area where it's never enough. We didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. We found ourselves unprepared and ill-equipped for the immensity of the problems that we've acknowledged. Abuse, harassment, troll armies, propaganda through bots and human coordination, misinformation campaigns, and divisive filter bubbles. Facebook estimated around 126 million people may have seen content from an IRA page. They also identified 170 Instagram accounts that posted 120,000 pieces of content during the 2016 campaign. Twitter announced it identified 3,814 IRA-controlled accounts and notified 1.4 million people they may have been in contact with one of them. Propaganda articles were published on at least 142 alternative media outlets. The social media companies removed accounts that were being run by foreign operatives. They built partnerships with fact checkers, and they instituted voluntary policies to label political ads. But the Russian operations didn't stop there. When the social media platforms try to start detecting it and start to crack down on fake accounts through 2018, you see a shift in the Russian efforts towards um, lower volume, higher quality content. 
we see them making up less content and instead using inauthentic means to amplify domestic voices. They've adopted the hashtags which are already there. This is where the real soul searching needs to happen in the West. Because if, if there weren't American trolls, the Russian trolls wouldn't have anybody to pretend to be. And so it's people in our own countries who are creating the environment and creating the kind of vitriolic rhetoric which then foreign actors can manipulate and which they can they can imitate. What we've seen in military planning documents coming out of Russia is this idea that we're going to go after the internal coherence of the enemy. And so success for Russia means undermining the most trusted American institutions, the government, the justice system, the media, however and wherever possible. We assess that foreign actors will view the 2020 U.S. elections as an opportunity to advance their interests. Nearly a billion dollars has been spent on Facebook and Google political ads in the U.S. since May of 2018. Targeted advertising is still offered on every major social platform. While tech companies have made efforts at transparency and blocking foreign interference, no new regulations or laws have been implemented to govern digital political advertising as a whole. We need to assume that these sorts of tactics are going to be with us essentially forever. The responsibility to do better certainly lays with the companies, to some extent it lays with the government, it also rests with all of us to be more skeptical consumers of the information that reaches us. The Russians weaponized social media in the 2016 election. Social media companies and policymakers have tried to respond. The question is whether a new startup, Russian or otherwise, will seek to exploit new vulnerabilities in the 2020 election that have not yet been identified or have not yet been addressed. If there are statements you've heard politicians say that don't quite make sense at rallies, state fairs, in that one friend's feed, let us know. Send us a note or a tweet with what they said and your question. We'll check it out. You can follow along by subscribing to the Post YouTube channel and watching more Fact Checker videos here.